Hello and welcome to America at its Best. I'm so glad you're able to join us today. My name is Rebecca Painter and I'll be your host for today's show. I'm coming to you from Columbia, South Carolina. I always like to give a little update about how the reopening is going here. And I just got word yesterday that as of Monday, so this coming Monday, just about everything's going to be reopening. Massage parlors, public pools. The one thing that's not yet open is my child's daycare. Also my husband's office, so I guess that's two things. So things remain hunkered down in the Painter household. All that to say, I'm glad to be here with you guys today and have a little break from that part of my life. <laughs> I wanna talk with some of you guys who are tuning in for the first time about why we're doing this show. And it goes back to what I was just saying. We've all gotta have a chance to get together and talk about some good things that are happening right now while many of us are still hunkered down in our homes. We miss seeing you and visiting you, talking with you about all that you're making possible. And right now, and over the course of the last, was it been eight or so weeks, every day feels a little bit the same. So I think it's about at that eight week mark. There have been tremendous solutions coming from the state network that are saving lives and livelihoods and it's all because of you. So we're just trying to give you guys 45 minutes to an hour every week to get some good news and tell you thank you. Those of you who joined us last week, we're able to hear from our friends in Tennessee about how they've been asked to reopen for, for solutions to reopen the economy. And the governors across this country are asking our state think tanks for help in this area and implementing their solutions. That brought us to an idea for today's show. We wanted to talk about leading in times of crisis because if there's one thing that's coming out of this network right now, it's extraordinarily high levels of leadership that's getting stuff done. Today we'll be joined by Kevin Roberts, who is the Executive Director of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and Carol Lee Bow, who joins us as President of the Yankee Institute in Connecticut. Welcome, Carol and Kevin. We're glad you guys are here with us today. Before we get to you guys, we're going to start by checking in with my personal role model for leadership in times of crisis and when times are good, Miss Tracy Sharp. Tracy, how are you? How are things in California? Well, I, we're doing fine, Rebecca. We're still sheltered in place, but it does give me a unique opportunity to think about what really matters, uh, to scan the landscape for opportunity and, and to chart a course for what the network is going to look like in the days ahead and the months ahead and really look to ways that we could continue to demonstrate how our ideas and our reforms, when they're put into action, can save lives and get people back to work. Well, Tracy, as you've been reflecting on some of that and, and planning for the future, I know for, for many years, you've talked a great deal about how this network is all about state solutions that have national impact, and that we're also working to build up an infrastructure for these ideas that will be here long after you and I are dead and gone. So what is the linchpin to making all of that happen? Oh, it's, it's leaders. We've got to have leaders. Now, when we talk about leaders and leadership in this network, I'd like to ask a question that our friend Ed Johnson from New Hampshire, New Hampshire submitted. And Ed, thanks so much for joining us again. We're so glad you're back. You gave me the best question to get us started off today. How are you defining a leader, Tracy, in terms of characteristics and principles of these folks? That's a great question. We tend to follow the Jim Collins concept of level five leadership that he put forth in his book, Good to Great. Uh, they, the, a level five leader displays a mixture of uh, personal humility, a lot of ambition and resolve, but that's ambition towards the cause, towards the purpose, not, not for themselves. A tendency to give credit to others when things are going well and to uh, assume responsibility and blame when things aren't going well. I would add two important components for leadership in crisis. And I think that's what we've seen a lot demonstrated in this network right now. And those characteristics are the ability to adapt quickly, to mm -hmm. pivot when needed. And secondly, the ability to emotionally regulate. We can't lead with fear as our motivator. And 
this has been leadership training and raising up level five leaders has been a long-term investment and goal for state policy network. And it's really paying off here now in the short term as we've had this network of leaders ready for crisis. And I'm looking forward uh, to hearing from our two leaders today who really stand out. Thank you, Tracy. Well, with that, we will turn it over to our first leader, Kevin Roberts, the executive director of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Kevin, we're so glad to have you with us today. How are things in Texas? Things are always great in Texas. So in spite of all of the challenges that even we're facing in our state, there's great hope, there's great encouragement here. And it, I'm just grateful to you and Tracy, everyone at SPN, and of course, your friends who are here, some of our friends as well on this broadcast, because I think what we're looking for are signs of hope. And I can tell you here in Texas, there are a lot of them. Well, Kevin, a lot of folks in today's world tend to look to politicians and even celebrities for leadership and guidance in the best of times and, and in the worst of times. Where does the think tank sitting in the big old state of Texas fit into that landscape? Well, as you know, for years, we fashioned ourselves as much as a do tank as a think tank, which is no disrespect intended to, to those organizations that want to focus on research, research papers only. We need them. But in our case, we're an organization of action. And, and I'm fond of saying that even more than a think tank or a do tank, we're known in Texas and increasingly beyond as an institution that you know, some of the philosophers would call us a mediating institution, that we help both policymakers as well as individual citizens understand what it is to be an American, what it is in our case to be Texans, which of course is just as important as being Americans. And so what's interesting during this, this last couple of months is that we have, have heard from literally thousands of people who say, Texas Public Policy Foundation, would you keep, keep please keep talking about our stories, our stories as individuals, our stories as business owners, our stories as local elected officials who are trying to do the right thing. And so I think we've learned in the last couple of months that sort of like your, your point about politicians or, or Hollywood stars, that we can play a distinctive leadership role by elevating the stories of individual Texans and individual Americans. That makes a lot of sense for an organization that's a proud member of this network, because that's precisely why we get up every day. That's very well said. So tell, share some of these stories that you guys are getting out there about Texans. Right well, I tell you, we had so much fun with this because we, over the last couple of years, we've invested heavily in building out our communication shop and praise God, because had we not done that, you know, that takes a while to do. And so to the heart of your question, we, we've started this series called Recovery Texas, because our point in playing our role in this crisis is not just to talk about policy, although that's really important. It mm -hmm. is tell the story of people. And so the first episode focused on three brothers who grew up in South Austin in a poor family, went to public schools, started a very successful furniture manufacturing company here in Austin. Austin's Couch Potatoes is their name. It's just wonderful. And they realized in the early days of this, when there was a mask shortage, even for healthcare workers, that there was a particular kind of fabric they had that was very appropriate for a healthcare setting. And so they stopped production of sofas and started making masks. We tell that story in that first episode. And second example, for those of you like me who live to eat barbecue, Rudy's Barbecue, great regional chain here in Texas, made a point of reopening as quickly as they could to provide free meals to healthcare workers, law enforcement workers, people on the front lines as their way of giving back to all of the business they've had over the last few decades. TPPF has made that happen because we have spent a lot of time the last couple of years interacting not just with policymakers, but with the people who really make society go and those are individuals like, like your guest to this broadcast and business owners, obviously not just in Texas, but all over the country. Thanks. Those, those are great stories, and I'm sure there's more where that came from. We might get back to that if we have time towards the end. Let's back up for a little, little bit here. You had, I imagine, quite a plan set for 2020 with your organization. And I'm sure you started catching wind that COVID might be coming Somehow you were able to read the tea leaves and pivot and get ready. Tell us what that was like and what, how that process went down. 
Well, I have to be honest, Rebecca, I think some other members of our staff are reading the tea leaves better than I was because we had a great plan and, and I love to charge hills. And so I was charging the hill for that plan. And my colleague and very good friend, Josh Trevino, whom many of you know well, said, Kevin, this coronavirus is a thing. And I said, Josh, no, no, it isn't. It isn't. He said, Kevin, the NBA just suspended the season. I said, yeah, that's because they're just not, not making good decisions. Well, I came just shy of actually berating him. In fact, I had to apologize later. It was about three days later, I realized he was right. Everything TPPF had planned for, for 2020 and our 2021 legislative session went out the window. And so within a period of three or four days as an executive team, we pivoted, we adapted. Not 50%, not 80%, 100%. And we decided that we would become the organization that tells the stories of Texans. We've become the organization that is amplifying the call to reopen Texas as quickly as possible. And also, of course, safely. Obviously, as a think tank, we believe data are really important. And I think increasingly, even people like Governor Abbott are turning to us and recognizing that we can keep those two things in balance, our economic and social flourishing, and making sure that those people who need to remain quarantined or isolated for some period of time do. So you mentioned Governor Abbott. Tell me specifically how you are a partner to Governor Abbott right now. Well, I tell you, it, it's humbling and, and a great privilege for the governor to have asked me to serve on his advisory council to reopen Texas, a very aptly named strike force in Texas. We try not That's to have- That's being confused with tax, task force, right? A amen, sister, because if it was a task force, I would not have said yes. I've been on enough strike of those force. where nothing happens. And so what I love about this strike force is that we're leaning forward as you would expect Texas to do. And, and no offense intended to those of you not in Texas, but we do understand that the country does look to this very well-run state as an example of how America can reopen. And so TPPF was invited to be part of the governor's strike force. We've had regular meetings. I speak with the governor and his staff frequently and advise them particularly on how we can keep these two things in balance. A very successful, flourishing economy and society while making sure we're spending our state resources on the most vulnerable to this virus. And I think up to this point, three weeks into the partial reopening of Texas, TPBF's voice has really been important. So what specifically has your voice helped implement already up to this point? Well, I'm a big fan of keeping things simple. And so when the governor called me to invite me on the strike force, he said, Kevin, you know, what, what are the top two things on your list? I said, Governor, number one, people want to live again. And so for some people, that's going to be sitting in their church pews in person. For others, that's going to be running on the wonderful running trails we have here in Austin, in spite of our mayor telling us not to do so. So I said, I think if you can come out and, 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 and he has a really good way of communicating sincere care for people with that Texas bravado, said, if you can come out and, and communicate that, I think it would be a real boon just to people's psyche. And I said, the second thing is, we really need to trust individuals and business owners to make their own decisions. All of us on this call know that when we're exercising what we know is our rational self-interest, that that's not somehow kind of selfish. In fact, it really helps the common good. And to his credit, I think the go Governor Abbott has understood that, he believes that. And I think when history tells the story of Texas reopening, I would anticipate that Governor Abbott's leadership will be held in high, high acclaim. As you look ahead a year, five years from now, what do you think the one thing TPPF could be doing right now under your leadership and that Governor Abbott could help implement that would improve the lives for Texans in years to come? Well, of course, it's, it's real tempting to talk about state budgets and kind of mainstream policy conversations. That's our impulse as a think tank. But I think what we're realizing, Rebecca, is that we've really hit a sweet spot for the first time in our organization's 30-year history in this respect. And that is that what we've done over the years by having legislative success, by mm -hmm. building a national brand with Right on Crime and some others, is that there are individual Americans who see us as, as an organization that's leading the way, that to some extent, and I don't mean this with any arrogance whatsoever, either personally or on behalf of the organization, it's very humbling, but an organization that is helping to define 
what it means to be in favor of limited government. That's not the end itself. The end itself is that humans flourish. And the more TPPF over the next five years can tell the stories of individuals and business owners flourishing, particularly in spite of what governments decide to do, I think that we will continue to hit our sweet spot. Well, Kevin, there's no doubt that under your leadership and Brooke's leadership before yours, TPPF has been a center where state solutions make national impact. When you mentioned you were able to quickly pivot and toss out your plans for 2020 and come up with a new agenda for in light of COVID, what are the top three things on that policy agenda right now? Well, you know, I'm a historian, so I can only think in chronological order. It's one of my many limitations. And so the first thing is we need to reopen and we need to reopen as quickly as possible because that means that we're trusting individuals and business owners to make good decisions. I think it's appropriate for the state government to provide some guidelines. So that's what our focus is for the next 30 days. And then the, the second of those items is whatever regulations have been suspended either at the state level or the federal level that allowed us to live more freely, to, to operate more efficiently. Mm -hmm. If it makes sense to do that now, why not just do that permanently? And so Great we have <laughs> a, a whole list of those, as of course many of our partner organizations in the network do that are Texas specific and because of our, our DC office, States Trust, we have some federal ideas as well. The third thing is, and, and it's, it's hard to identify just that one third thing, but the third thing is sort of looking forward. I, you know, I'm a conservative because I grew up in a poor family in a poor state in Louisiana during the oil bust in the 1980s. We didn't look to the government for handouts. We didn't look to the government to sort of give us a leg up. We looked to one another. And what we recognized was that government has gotten too large. In fact, it's gotten too expensive. But I think what we have to do at TPPF, Rebecca, is not leave the explanation there. We have to explain why and how it's actually more caring it's more loving that we in the nonprofit sector, whether someone's faith-based or not faith-based, should be the front line of providing that temporary safety net for our brothers and sisters. If at TPPF we can do that or even play a tiny role in doing that, I think we will have succeeded for a very long time. And Kevin, you talked earlier about stories. Are you continuing to gather stories in all three of these areas and, and push them out so people understand that this is an emotionally compelling thing, not just facts and figures? Oh, it, it, tremendously, Rebecca. In fact, what I did to make sure we could continue those uh, coming is that when I was appointed the Governor's Strike Force, we created at TPPF our own internal economic recovery council with a bunch of business leaders and, and supporters. We've got about 20 folks on there and they give me stories every day. In fact, as I was coming to work today, uh, my son who's 15, who has a need to visit a barber unlike dad, said, dad, you, could you tell the story in one of your videos about my barber? His barber, Timothy Flem, in our little town, Liberty Hill, Texas, is an African-American army vet whose business has been shut down. I might argue pretty unnecessarily. We've got 967 people in Liberty Hill. But the point is, everyone I come into contact with, because they know our ability at TPPF to tell stories, is telling me, here's another idea for you. So I'm really excited about the future and telling more stories about Texans and Americans. Good. Well, Kevin, thank you. We appreciate hearing your stories and all the great stuff you guys are doing in Texas. Something you said hey, just... Sir. I'm yeah, sorry. I, just I was about to ask you to add in. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I love that story that Kevin just told because it, it just demonstrates how, how our solutions can give a fair shot for the little guy, for small businesses and to push against a corporate welfare right? We fight for those without a voice and a choice. So I, I love how they've been able to amplify these stories, especially through their, their great video work. Thank you, Kevin. Yep, you're welcome. I, as I told Governor Abbott, you're going to hear from the Fortune 500 companies, and, and that's fine. I mean, we know we disagree with a lot of them over corporate welfare things. But I said, Governor, what you're going to hear from me because of my upbringing and because of the heart of TPPF is representing the little guy. And he said, Kevin, that's why you're on the strike force. So I think we've got a real opportunity. Thank you, Kevin. And Tracy, just to follow up from one other thing Kevin mentioned, he talked about his ability to pivot quickly. And I've been hearing that thread from other leaders who've been a part of the show in the last couple of weeks. Do you feel that this is yet another characteristic of the leadership that you're looking for and, and cultivating across this network? And 
did SPN do anything to help some of these leaders pivot quickly in time of crisis or did they just do it because they're awesome? <laughs> well, Probably both. Certainly in, in the first couple of weeks that the crisis became apparent, probably around the time that Josh Trevino was uh, letting you know, Kevin, well, we were on the phone talking, and up to now we've talked to every state and county CEO and several of their staff. I think the fastest way was just connecting them to each other, to share ideas, to share what's working in their state, what's not, and then they can take that back to customize it. In this way, these ideas, it really accelerates the whole process. And leaders can learn best from other leaders. It's what they do. It's not because we're any better. It's because most of the time we have to go first and persuade others to follow. And when leaders in this network are unified around a, a forces for good, success follows. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Kevin. Now we're going to take it over to Carol Lee Bow, president of Yankee Institute in Connecticut. Carol, welcome to the show. How are you doing in Connecticut? So far, so good. Good. Now, Carol, like Kevin, you had big plans for 2020 and you had to pivot quickly. What was that like for you as the leader in a blue state where I imagine you are a, uh, a lonely voice trying to push some of these things forward? Well, uh, you know, it was interesting because here in Connecticut, a lot of people, of course, saw the, the, the pandemic as a crisis. And we all know big government never lets a crisis go to waste. So at Yankee Institute, we knew it was important to sort of counter program against that big government narrative and prove there's a better way than simply letting government take over. So what we wanted to do, Rebecca, was uh, sort of a, 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 double, uh, a double whammy. And first, we created a beam of light initiative to highlight uh, what Edmund Burke once called the, the sort of the little platoons of civil society. And so what we set out to do was tell the stories of the countless acts of generosity, kindness, and individual initiative across our state. And one of my favorites uh, is this college student from Woodbridge and, and his relatives fled communist China. And he and his dad designed a face shield for medical workers and then they organized volunteers from the local Chinese American community, all of them refugees uh, from or, or with family in communist China. And they together distributed the masks throughout Connecticut. Another favorite of mine is this small struggling Ridgefield pizzeria, and it has this no one goes hungry pledge, promising a free cheese pizza every day to anyone who didn't have enough to eat. And those wow. were the sorts of beam of light stories we tried to disseminate across Connecticut. So you aren't the lonely voice fighting for being able to give people, you know, teach them how to fish instead of giving them the fish in Connecticut. It sounds like other people are doing things without government. That's fantastic to know. Absolutely. You know, uh, we have a lot of lions, as uh, to use a, a famous metaphor, we just give the roar. <laughs> I like that. All right, Carol, have you been able to get strong economic policy reforms through during this time of crisis in a state like Connecticut? We have been pleased uh, because, of course, the governor would rather die than admit he's listening to us, but he does listen to us. And we released also on the policy side uh, some pandemic policy papers that were designed to be proposals to reduce economic fallout, uh, use the lessons learned in the pandemic for reform, especially emphasizing the fact that if deregulation is good in the middle of a crisis, of course, it makes sense all the time. And then also to uh, sort of position the playing field to be ready to fix more of Connecticut's ongoing problems after the pandemic was over. And the governor did adopt three of our proposals, uh, a hold harmless unemployment provision for small businesses to make sure their tax rates didn't go up, waiving occupational licensing requirements and filing fees for a lot of services, and then creating a, a sort of task force unfortunately not a strike force, to plan for the reopening of Connecticut with members of various sectors of the economy, including small businesses, which uh, sometimes are all too prone to be overlooked here, uh, much to uh, our disagreement. That's fantastic, Carol. Now, yes. 
that's impressive in Connecticut that you've been able to take it that far. I think sometimes in blue states, our friends forget that think tanks like yours stop a lot of really bad stuff from becoming the new normal. And I live in fear that something bad that goes through in Connecticut is going to come down to South Carolina. So can you tell us about some of the bad things you guys have stopped? <laughs> well, you know, that's always, uh, that's always the concern here because uh, we want to always make sure that there isn't this, uh, this, this idea that a lot of things get engineered here that will, if they succeed, spread to South Carolina, to Texas, to Florida, to Ohio, to a lot of different places. And so uh, we do stop things. Um, we have managed to roll back uh, some, some provisions in the estate tax, a lot of different tax increases, and uh, to push back quite significantly on the power of the government uh, labor unions. And we're committed to continuing to do that because it can be done. And, um, and one of the things that we work on uh, most, most uh, vociferously actually is a lot of these uh, government speech rules. And uh, there's a lot of these uh, campaign finance reforms that the left is very fond of that mm -hmm. would in fact curb Americans' First Amendment rights in ways that no free person should be uh, willing to put up with. And Yankee Institute has been very successful in making sure that the people of Connecticut understand this is not the way that any of us should wanna do business. Okay, next question. I wanna change, change gears a little bit. And before I ask this question, please, if you're listening and a question has popped into your mind for any of our speakers, you can insert your question in the Q&A box at the bottom. I got so excited about asking my questions, I forgot to remind you guys to please ask yours. All right, Carol, you've been really great at bringing people together in your state. And we're at a place now where you just can't do that. So how has your organization adjusted to that issue? Well, uh, we've been pleased to have some televised town halls and uh, gather some speakers that we hope that many of the people who are interested in Yankees work want to hear. So uh, Lieutenant, former Lieutenant Governor of New York, Betsy McCoy, was willing to serve as our guest uh, on, on one of them. She's one of our board members. And of course, uh, someone who works in, in the scholarship of infectious diseases and healthcare. And so she was our guest for one of them. And then tomorrow, we'll be having a law professor John Yu, who's uh, at Bolt Hall at Berkeley and an old friend of mine from our days clerking in Washington, DC. And he'll be talking about various legal issues surrounding reopening, surrounding pension law and allowing states to go bankrupt and anything else that some of our participants want to hear about. So can anyone join these teletown halls? Uh -huh. Well, we've uh, sent invitations out to some of uh, Yankee Institute's friends, but of course, any friend of SPN is a friend of Yankee Institute. Good to know. In fact, Tracy, I've been hearing from a few think tanks that they've started to experiment with different ways to bring people together, teletown halls, things of this nature. Do you see this as being a trend across the network or are these just random stories I've been hearing? Uh, it's a powerful trend. It's a powerful method to reach out into our communities, right? We, they are uh, trusted because they're there. They live there. They're, they're also sheltered in place, right? And instead of dividing, they're working to bring people together, to not subtract, but to multiply these voices. And I think it's a unique role the state think tanks can play. It's the value that the power of subsidiarity is they're closer to the action. They can connect with their communities, bring people together, find the solutions that best fit, that are relevant for their areas, and really show how market principles can mitigate suffering. Thank you. Carol, Carol to that end, uh, Kevin had some great examples of the people who they're trying to help in the state of Texas. I imagine you've got a few as well. Can you share some of those stories? Because as I said at the beginning, this is about sharing some good news and I find these to be very uplifting. Sure. Um, what, some of the people we're trying to help in particular, for example, have to do even with uh, a lot of the small businesses in Connecticut who are, uh, who are being cut off at the knees um, by some of the regulations and the way that uh, the, the governor's reopened Connecticut advisory board uh, has gone about um, 
opening. And we were very pleased just this week, um, for example, um, even the woman who does my hair, of course, um, a central concern for any self-respecting female, uh, has, uh, was, uh, was very concerned along with other salon owners throughout Connecticut because the advisory board um, had said, you are able to have women, uh, you know, you can bring people into your shop, you can cut their hair, but you're not going to be allowed to blow it dry. And one of the things that Yankee Institute has been emphasizing is that in all these uh, rules that are supposed to be underpinning the reopening of the state, that there should be transparency. Normal people should be able to understand what, what is going into the decisions being made and also the science. Like what is the scientific basis for this rule? And of course, it's completely incoherent uh, that you can cut someone's hair, but not blow it dry, especially because heat is supposed to kill the virus. And um, we were pleased that the pushback on this commission was sufficient that in the same day that this mandate about cutting hair, but not blowing it dry, uh, it was sufficient that they reversed, the commission reversed itself. And now small salon owners like the one I go to, they will be able to take care of their customers fully and make a living. Wow. Well, let me just say, amen, sister, as Kevin was saying, amen, sister. <laughs> I'm coming to Connecticut to get my hair cut. Thank you very much. Well, come on, Tracy. We're, we're here. And as far as Yankee Institute's concerned, we want to be open for business. <laughs> Carol, Hugh Hewitt recently called you a brilliant, generous, compassionate public intellectual and activist. That's a direct quote. I have always called you as a dynamo who gets stuff done in a deeply blue state. As you're looking ahead and you're thinking about the upcoming budget battles, where is Yankee in all this? Well, um, Yankee Institute will be where it has always been, which is firmly on the side of taxpayers who want to be, as Yankee's catchphrase expresses it, free to succeed. Yankee Institute believes in uh, changing lives through freedom and opportunity. And frankly, um, Tracy and Rebecca, I would be remiss if I didn't thank State Policy Network, because when I came to Yankee six years ago now, just this month, uh, one of the things that I had never done was, was have a lot of the skills uh, that, that would help me with things like development and strategic planning. And I really appreciated the way that you all came alongside and uh, helped equip me with some of these skills. And so I have a wonderful board. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of wonderful freedom fighters here in Connecticut that people don't realize they're here and we are gonna bust the state wide open. But I cannot uh, thank you all enough for some of the skills that you made sure we had to be positioned to succeed. Well, thank you, Carol. And I think, you know, you are very unique in a very special position in the state of Connecticut right now, leading at a time where, where your leadership's needed more than ever before. As you look at the landscape, what do you feel is the greatest opportunity and the greatest challenge for Yankee moving forward? Well, there is definitely an opportunity here uh, because, you know, um, with Connecticut's policies, it's always a bit of a rough ride, but now uh, we're on a roller coaster headed for the edge of a fiscal cliff a little bit. Uh, what with Connecticut's underfund, uh, underfunded public pensions. And uh, people understand this, I think, with the, the, the economic damage that the pandemic has created. And we have come to a place where, as Ronald Reagan put it, you know, the future belongs to it doesn't belong to the faint-hearted, it belongs to the brave. And I think Yankee Institute has a real opportunity to say, look, you know, we had these problems, but now uh, you have a state whose policies are in effect trying to chop off our legs and leave us uh, in a place where we cannot move forward. They simply want to double down on the failed policies of the past. And what we need to do is look, we've talked a lot about what businesses are non-essential. Let's talk for a change about non-essential government. 
and let's make the reforms we need to get rid of non-essential government so that we as a people can move forward to a new era of prosperity. Because we can do it, but we just need to make the changes that will let us run and move forward together. All I can say to that is to echo Tracy and Kevin with an amen sister. <laughs> <laughs> amen, <laughs> hallelujah. Carol. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'd add, uh, Rebecca, uh, that in so many of these states, if not for the state think tank, there would be very little organized resistance, like what Carol has pulled together. She says she, ha she has a lot of allies in the deeply blue states. It's because Yankee has forged those coalitions, that Yankee drives this resistance, but also can work with a governor to get good things put through and then to hold that ground. We, need, we have this in every state, the 50 state network, and we're deeply grateful for every CEO that uh, does the yeoman's work at the ground level to forge these coalitions, to resist when it's necessary, to push forward good ideas when there's an opportunity. Certainly the pandemic has opened a gap. It's opened uh, an opportunity that we can charge through that gap with our ideas to really show how, how they can uh, serve people. That's very well said. And it's worth noting that, you know, we've got Carol and Kevin on today. That's two out of 64 leaders all across all 50 states. So it's, it's amazing that you guys are out there leading these charges. Now I'd like to take a few minutes and open it up to questions. We had uh, one question we haven't gotten to yet that was submitted before the show started. And um, I think anybody, this is for all three of you. Have you guys seen some positives? And this is from Byron Lamb, by the way. By Byron, thanks for, for joining us again. Have you guys seen some positives from working remotely that you think will be carried on once social distancing is over? I think in our case, if, if you don't mind my starting, Carol, it, you've got several dozen people who work at our headquarters here in Austin, about 75 or 80 employees here. Two things, number one, it will not surprise many of you to know that I'm not an early adopter to technology, so I'm skeptical about remote work. And I know I'm talking to SPN, y'all have perfected this. But I think in our case, because traffic is such a cataclysmic problem here in Austin with the quick growth we've had, that it will be likely we will do some sort of hybrid arrangement moving forward, because it's really important to us that our, our employees are not merely employees, right? They're colleagues, they're brothers and sisters, that they have a really good quality of life. I will say though, that we will never go fully remote because there is something irreplaceable about being in the middle of things in person. And that's a real important part that is building community for the work that we do. Carol, do you have anything to add? Um, well, one of the things that has been, I, I think, uh, an unexpected benefit of this is driving home to the people of Connecticut just how important it is that we put some of these uh, choices that we're confronting front and center, that uh, some of these difficulties can't be deferred. The time is now, and, uh, and we need to, to really start thinking about do we stay in place or do we make the decisions that are necessary uh, to, to move forward together. Yeah. You know, Rebecca, one of the first uh, bits of training and um, guidance that our staff put together was something we had pretty much formed uh, previous to the virus, and that was how to run a virtual office. The pluses, the minuses, the do's, the don'ts, how to maximize the benefits and minimize the downside. And we were able to distribute that in March very quickly and then do uh, webinars and training on it. We have heard since from a few CEOs that have decided after experiencing a, com a complete virtual office uh, activity that they're not going to go back to physical offices or at least reduce their amount of physical space needed. Because in their state and for what the strengths of their staff are, they're able to do that and, and it helps them cut costs. But I want to emphasize, as we always say, every state is different. And I think this pandemic has accentuated that, that the needs of Texas are different than the needs of New York and certainly different than the needs of California. So the groups that are making that decision, <laughs> everything's different than California, but the groups that are making the decision to make sure they have that physical presence, that they come back to an office, 
they're doing that because it, it works best for the strength and the power they need to exert from their offices. And others will choose to go virtual. The fact is, is they have to make that decision based on what's best for their strengths, their assets, and the need to serve the people in their state. And Thank we you. realized, you know, just through becoming more conversant uh, with Zoom and comfortable with this, um, we've been able to actually um, have a lot more uh, meetings. We, we have a morning and an afternoon staff meeting, which we never did when we were actually in a real uh, bricks and mortar office. And uh, the collaboration, the opportunities have been fantastic. And we attribute a lot of what we've been able to get done just to having those opportunities for uh, collaboration and germination of ideas. Thank you. Okay, another question coming at you guys. This is a great question. Kevin, you are fortunate in that you've got the ear of your governor and you're on the strike force. Carol, being in the state that you're in uh, with a different kind of governor, how are you getting your stories and messages out? Well, we're fortunate because uh, we've cultivated some strong relationships with, uh, with radio across the state. We have a, a, a website and a Twitter account, Facebook, a lot of different social media that uh, generates a lot of interest and that is uh, well listened to. And if there's any advantage in being one of the only uh, right-leaning voices in the state, it is that people tend to pay attention to what you say because you're counter-messaging a lot of what everything else, uh, everything else that's out there. So, uh, so we've been fairly successful, I think, at uh, being able to, to have our voices heard. Great. Any parting thoughts, comments, or questions before I ask Tracy to wrap us up? All right, Tracy, over to you. I do. I, I just want to... Oh, sorry. <laughs> there's a delay in Zoom. Go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> there's, there's, there's always a delay from Texas because we're, we're uh, working hard. But thank, I just wanted to thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Tracy. Carol, it's always great to, to see you. But a message for all of your guests who are supporters in one way or another of the State Policy Network. I just want to thank you for being so, but also thank you for what you're doing as individuals, as business owners. By virtue of being on this call, you're successful. And to some extent or another, I know that this this crisis has affected you personally, perhaps professionally. I just want you to know, as you've heard from Carol and from Rebecca and Tracy, that all of us are working every day to tell the story of America, which is that individuals will continue to fight. We will continue to exercise our virtual self, our virtuous self-interest for the sake of the common good. And just appreciate your being part of this network. And the one thing I wanted to mention is all of us at Yankee are aware every day when we come into work um, that what you do is really what makes what we do possible. And we're incredibly thankful, not just to SPN, but to generous partners like you across the country who makes it possible for us to do work we love. And uh, every day, I'm grateful for that. Yes, you know, Rebecca, to give this a, a little context, I remember something Arthur Brooks and I had talked about in a phone call back in uh, 2013, just before uh, Carol came on the scene. Arthur recognized that SPN is a leadership incubator, that part of our unique value is how leaders will self-identify locally by connecting with Yankee or connecting with uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation. And then when they when being involved with the think tanks, it can be like an assembly line where SPN has a process for continually cultivating and developing leadership. And these leaders go on to serve as governors, as state AGs, as members of Congress, and our very own vice president got his start at a state think tank. So when you have leaders multiplying like this, uh, coming up through the ranks, it's like compound interest because Every successful social movement in this country, whether it's a ratifying a woman's right to vote or civil rights movement or marriage equality, it required, it depended on leaders. And what's more, leaders that are part of an infrastructure like this 50 state network, like the two leaders you heard from today, this is a great concern to our opposition because they have nothing as durable as this network of leaders built in large part uh, thanks to the generosity of uh, those on this call. 
they have built a durable network, a network of leaders that in times of crisis, right, at just the right time, we were ready to adapt and pivot and serve the people in our states and in our communities. I'm so grateful that we can, week after week, bring on new leaders that just bring their unique qualities and success, and we can highlight that to our, our generous supporters. Thank you, Tracy. That was very well said. And uh, with that, I'd like to echo what Kevin and Carol said, and thank you guys for everything that you do. Let you know that next week we've got a special show. We'll have Nick Gillespie on with Reason Foundation and also Jim Sturges with the Pioneer Institute in Massachusetts to have a robust conversation about civil liberties. So I hope you guys can tune in and join us then. Thank you so much for joining us and for making all this possible. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Take care.